Hello again. The channel is for you if you want to know what it takes to work with animals. I aim to cover every conceivable job within the animal industry. My next guest is Randy Zanke, a trapper and president of the Alaskan Trappers Association. He talks about setting traps based on signs, animal signs that is, being a tracker, and how to get started as a trapper in Alaska. Are young women and children the future of trapping in Alaska? Randy Zanke, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Well, thanks, John. I'm looking forward to the conversation. What is trapping and what is the trapper's goal in Alaska? You're out in the great outdoors trying to outsmart and uh, be in the right place at the right time with the right equipment to harvest uh, a fish or an animal, or in this case, a fur bearer. To some people in Alaska, trapping is still a very important uh, source of income. To others, it's more of a lifestyle that they aspire to, to spend time in the wilderness. So Randy, can it be a full-time job? It certainly can be. The wilderness presumably, is completely untouched by man, is it? Uh, yes, there are places, as I mentioned before, that are 100 or 200 miles from anywhere. To be perfectly honest with you, I think for most trappers, that is the most appealing part of what we do. Once you get accustomed to living in the wilderness, um, it's intoxicating. You want more of it. What are the species that Alaskan trappers target? Uh, there are 13 species of fur bearers. Um, I could rattle through all of them. Um, and the, the, the most uh, desirable species have changed over time. Um, there was a time 60, 70 years ago when mink was the number one. And then there was a period of time when beaver was number one in terms of uh, effort by trappers. Um, and those things change over time. Uh, primarily based on fur markets. And um, that's primarily dictated by fashion markets. So some of the fashion centers over in your part of the world, in Paris and Milan and Berlin, they will try to sell long-haired furs. So maybe lynx will be popular for a while. Fashions change, and uh, that applies to the fur industry as well. The trapper has to be flexible to adjust to what is the, 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 the highest paying furs at the time. What other personal qualities does a trapper need? You have to be willing to uh, endure cold weather and prepare yourself for it, have the right clothing, uh, have uh, emergency gear with you, that sort of thing. The ability to withstand cold or, or even relish the cold is one thing. Physical strength is part of it. I run my trap line on snowshoes, and so um, it's a very short trap line, but you know, you have it, it's quite a workout. Other people that run their trap lines with, um, with snow machines, you invariably get stuck. Even with the best snow machine and the best rider, you still get stuck. Some of the traps are very that we use are very strong, and so you have to have strength in your hands and your arms to set some of those traps. So physical strength is part of it, but you have to enjoy being alone. Most trappers do enjoy being in the woods by themselves. What 
what skills does a trapper need? Do they need to be mechanical? Yeah, mechanical uh, ability is uh, definitely an asset. Other skills, once you have caught the animal, um, you have to skin it and then stretch it and dry it before you sell it in the fur market. The, the last thing you want to do is cut a hole in this hide that you just spent so much time trying to catch. And now you have them and you don't, you want to present it to the fur buyer in the best possible condition. And so that's a skill that just improves over time. You don't start out as a great skinner, but you, you, you develop into one usually. Other skills, one that is more innate rather than learned is the ability to um, interpret animal movement. Um, here we always have snow on the ground during trapping season. And so you can see the tracks of the animals and the ability to uh, say, okay, I remember that this lynx or this otter or this wolf or this wolverine crossed my trail in the same place last time I came through. And you have to have either keep records or have a good memory to uh, uh, have a good record of that. And then you take advantage by setting a trap in that location. And I just touched on the ability to read tracks. Um, it's something that um, does not take very long to learn how to distinguish um, you know, a fox track from a wolf track from a lynx track. And, you know, but it is a skill, and it without it, um, you would not be a very effective trapper. Um, one of the phrases that is commonly uh, uh, shared amongst trappers is that you set on sign. And what that means is when you see a lot of martin tracks or lynx tracks in an area, that's what we refer to as sign. And then you set your traps in that area. You, you don't go out and say, oh, I as a human think that this would be a good place to catch an otter if you've never seen an otter trap. So you set on sign, which goes back to developing the ability to uh, identify specific uh, the, the tracks of certain people. Do trappers have a philosophy as such or a set of ethics? Trappers generally love the wilderness. There's a misconception that trappers want to catch every last animal. Uh, we sometimes refer to far, uh, trappers as farmers. We farm our, our, our species. So you don't want to go and catch every last marten in an area or every last wolf. You want to leave enough. We refer to it as seed. Once again, like a, a farmer would say, you have to have seed for the following year. Uh, so that's, I guess, a somewhat of a philosophy. Um, trappers, of course, have come under attack for the last uh, 50 years by anti-trappers, people who don't believe in consumptive use. And so the, the responsible ethical trapper is constantly on guard to not violate any ethical standards. You don't set traps where... Um, um, another person or a dog or whatever may encounter it, um, you, you avoid those situations at all costs. Some target animals uh, are so different in their behavior and habitat requirements. For example, um, muskrat uh, compared to bobcat. Going after those two different species needs a totally different mentality. Yeah, I couldn't agree more um, than the two species that you pick. We don't have bobcats here, but we have lynx and they're very similar in appearance and behavior. Um, you know, the, the muskrat needs water. And so um, you would not trap muskrat up on a hillside. You just would not find them there. Um, similarly, um, uh, lynx can wander widely and um, but they're more of a forest dweller. Uh, you wouldn't find them out in an open marsh, for example. And you have to think differently because the animals are, are different. Uh, some of the animals that we trap here, and I'm speaking primarily of the canids, that being the wolf, the coyote, the fox, they have a very keen sense of smell. And so we teach each other 
that you have to be what we refer to as clean. In other words, you don't want to leave any human scent at a when you where you set a trap or a snare. And um, but with other species like the martin, which we've discussed here today quite quite a bit, um, they're not at all um, turned off or afraid of uh, a human scent. So you have that to consider whether the animal has a good sense of smell and is very wary um, versus others that um, all you have to do is put uh, the trap in the right place and put some bait there and they'll come right in. What, if any, research projects do trappers engage with? Snaring for wolves is probably the uh, primary way that they are taken. But those snare cables have to be very strong. And uh, there is always a, a possibility here in the interior, at least, that a moose might get caught in that snare. And so um, that's, of course, something we don't want to happen. And so um, our local management agency is called the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And in the interest of transparency, I'll say that I used to work for that agency. Um, but one of their biologists spent a couple of years developing a snare that would be strong enough to hold a wolf, but would break away if a moose got caught in it. Once again, in the interest of full transparency, I, I've been supporting personally uh, a young gal who is studying the genetic uh, uh, profile of wolverine in, in Alaska. What, what is the best part about trapping? Being out on the trail, doing something physical, something that you enjoy, and you get rewarded by catching an animal. And in contrast, what's the worst thing about trapping? Whenever you have an accident, Randy, can you describe how your own career developed, please? Uh, as a trapper or as a biologist? A hmm. little bit of both. Okay. Well, um, I grew up in Wisconsin, as I mentioned, and uh, always had a love of the outdoors. My father was a very avid hunter and fisherman. He wasn't a trapper. Um, I always enjoyed science when I was in school, and so I combined the two of them and got a degree as a uh, PhD degree in veterinary science and wildlife ecology, and then got a job with the Department of Fish and Game uh, studying the diseases and parasites of wildlife. My career as a, as a trapper, um, when I started working at Fish and Game in 1978, there were quite a few guys that trapped, and some of the guys that became my closest friends invited me to go out to their trap line uh, for a weekend, and I was immediately enthralled with the lifestyle. And uh, when I got back to town, I, I, I put the wheels in motion to uh, find a location. And then one of the other guys that I worked with agreed to go out with me on, on this area and teach me how to set traps and snares. The, the gentleman that taught me how to trap, when I would come into work on Monday morning after checking my traps on the weekend, I had question after question after question for him. And uh, after half a season of that, he looked at me one time and said, you know, young man, he says, trapping is a disease and you have a very bad case of it. Randy, how can somebody get into trapping? The one, number one thing is to take a class to learn how to use all the different tools that trappers need, find some older person that might be willing to take you along, show you the ropes. And if you're hardworking and on time and uh, diligent about uh, skinning and that sort of thing, you'll develop a real working relationship with this person. And eventually um, <clears throat> there might be an opportunity to hand that the, the primary responsibility for that trap line from the older person to the younger person. The other way that I recommend is um, 
to go out towards the end of the season, and our season here generally ends around the end of February or in the beginning of March, by that time, trappers will have well-established trails that are easy to distinguish and just go down those trails. And if you find traps and snares or other evidence of trapping, well, then we have um, an ethic in our group that you don't trap on top of another trap. You find your own area. And... Um, so if you find evidence of trapping, well, that's not a space for you then. You have to find something else. But if you keep looking and keep talking to people at meetings and that sort of thing, you'll eventually find a place where you can squeeze in. And there are other uh, options too. Um, you know, a lot of the um, lodges, the hunting lodges, the fishing lodges up here that um, are in remote parts of the state um, the vast majority of them would love to have a winter caretaker. And almost all of them will have a snow machine, and most of them will already have traps and snares there on site. And so if you're the kind of person that has uh, enough knowledge of plumbing and carpentry and that sort of thing that you could be a good caretaker, you can find opportunities like that but you have to once again have those characteristics of being reliable and honest and all that sort of thing. But if you can find those situations, that could be just almost perfect because you're alone. Uh, you, you don't have a lot of other trappers around you. Um, you have the equipment almost provided for you. You already have a comfortable place to live. As a trapper, which books or people or meetings that most influenced your thinking? Well, we had a man that was a fur buyer. He was a trapper and a fur buyer here in town. His name was Dean Wilson. He always had the right advice at the right time. And he wrote a book about 35 years ago that was very popular at the time. Um, so that was uh, a big thing for me. Uh, I already told you about the man that taught me how to trap. His name is John Burns, or is John Burns. And, uh, you know, he was a great source of advice for me. The Alaska Trappers Association, uh, we have a, a big group here in the Fairbanks area. We have meetings every month with about 75 people uh, at each meeting. And um, if you have encountered something on your line that you don't understand or something's not working, you can always find somebody that will offer advice at those meetings as well. Randy, how would you describe the trapping industry today, please? The trappers have faced criticism from the anti-consumptive users for decades now. Um, that is not quite as significant as it was back in the 80s. That whole movement is still in existence, but it's not as strong as it was back then. We still face it and have to deal with it. Um, but then I can go to a totally different aspect, and that is the, the financial side of things. Um, one of the major um, markets for fur is, has been, for the past 20 years or more, has been in China and Russia. Uh, even though Russia has their own fur bear population, the demand for fur there is greater than what they can provide. And so they're a net importer of fur. But when currencies go out of balance, then... Um, you know, it's harder to sell furs in places like that. Now with the Ukraine war, you know, nobody wants to do business with Russia. So we go all the way from the, the anti-trappers and dealing with that to the economics of it can, can change things. And so for a trapper, if he doesn't have a good market, some people will just say uh, it's literally not worth my time to go out because I can't sell my product for an, to even cover my expenses. How do you see the trapping industry changing over the next 10 years? We're going to see a lot more younger people and women involved.
getting uh, youngsters and women interested in trapping? How does that work, that kind of recruitment? There's a group called the National Trappers Association over here, and uh, probably three or four years ago, they started printing a regular column called the She Side, and it was written by a woman trapper about other women trappers. And I really enjoyed that column, and uh, it just started the wheel spinning for me. And I thought, what can we do something similar to that earlier this year in March? We provided what we called the Women's Trapping Summit and uh, lined up a bunch of women and a couple of men as instructors and in just invited women who had an interest in, in trapping to attend. And now we had, I believe, 53 women show up and the, the dominant age group was in the 20s and 30s. We think that a bunch of those women will become trappers on their own. A month ago, we offered a special workshop just for children. You don't sit and lecture to a 10-year-old for eight hours. You'll lose them after the first 10 minutes. And so we had a lot of hands-on activities where uh, they built things or worked with uh, uh, more hands-on. And we think that that was very effective as well. The attendance at the meetings is not so much um, teaching them how to trap, but more providing an atmosphere that they find appealing and want to be part of as they grow older. Uh, a few questions, Randy, that, that come off the back of a, uh, another interview that I did recently. Um, in trapping, what is an attractant? If you catch a hare and maybe harvest the meat for yourself, but the, you have the carcass left, um, you can use that as bait or link. If you go moose hunting in the fall and you're successful, um, you'll have um, bones from the, the moose that are a real strong attractant for wool. That's bait, something they can eat. Lure is more something they can smell. And uh, lynx have a very poor sense of smell, so you really wouldn't probably use lure uh, regularly for lynx. But for wolves, for all the canids, the, the, the wolf, the coyote, the fox, they have a very strong sense of smell. And um, you would, you would uh, use smell to draw them in where you can catch them. And an attractant um, could be uh, an odor but, um, you know, I just mentioned that lynx don't have a very good sense of smell, but they have a very keen eyesight. And so one of the attractants that you will use at uh, a place where you're trying to catch lynx is to hang a duck wing or uh, a grouse wing, um, hang it by fishing line so that just the gentlest of breezes will get it to spin or move. And you try to put that in an area where there's good sight lines in all directions. And so if a lynx is moving through the area, they will see that spinning or just the gentle movement of that wing. And that'll be an attraction to bring them in. What behaviors do you look out for on the trap line, Randy? Animal behaviors, target animal behaviors. If you see tracks crossing your trail in the same place um, week after week, um, you know, if you're going to be an effective trapper, you have to be alert for that sort of thing. And how is global warming and how did COVID affect trapping in recent times? Trappers really didn't have to change their activity very much because they're generally out by themselves. And so the possibility for COVID transmission is almost nil. We didn't hold meetings during uh, that period of time. As far as global warming uh, for trappers, it really has an effect of that much. What advice, Randy, can you offer somebody considering taking up the trapping lifestyle? You have to be uh, self-sufficient, able to be out on uh, a snow machine or a snowshoe line by yourself and be able to handle things that come up. We've also thought you can't be afraid of cold weather or being alone.
Randy, is there anything that you'd like to add? And so over a couple of years, I developed a project, um, just called it a My Oral History Project. And I have recorded um, interviews like you and I are doing today, although I just use audio, not video. And I recorded, I think it's now up to 198 people around Alaska. And folks that knew about that project insisted that I write a book. Well, I can't say that I wrote the book because what I did is I had the interviews transcribed. And then I selected what I thought were the 30 best, and I put them together in a book. We now offer, through the Trappers Association, we have a collection of six books that um, have served two purposes. Um, we have made a little bit of money off them, not as much as we thought we might. But what's happened is it's kind of given us um, a greater, a higher profile on the national scene. When I go to national meetings now, people say, oh, yeah, I read your last book, boy, it was really great, you know, and I've read all your others, too. And so we've kind of become known as the, uh, the association around the country that produces these really great outdoor books. They're just very entertaining and educational. Randy Zarnke, president of the Alaska Trappers Association, thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Well, thanks for having me, John. I've enjoyed it.